This video is sponsored by Conflict of Nations, the free online strategy game where you get to find out what it's like to take control of a real country and lead it in modern global warfare. The Cold War is turning hot. In this all-new scenario set in the 1980s, you'll choose a real country to lead and take on up to 128 other players in real-time games that can take weeks to complete. Which strategy will you use, diplomacy or all-out nuclear war? Simply click the link in the description to try the new Cold War map to find out. It's fully cross-platform, so you can play on the same account on PC and mobile. And the infographic show viewers also get a special gift of 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free when they use the link. It's only available for 30 days, so click the link, choose a country, and start fighting your way to victory right now. Three B-52s scream across the sky on a bombing mission to take out the North Vietnamese Army, or NVA, targets. For added protection from the NVA's electronically guided surface-to-air missiles SAMs, the bombers are escorted by two Douglas EB-66s, call out signs BAT-21 and BAT-22. One of the main duties of the EB-66s is to sweep for enemy radar and jam it. On BAT-21 is a crew of six, a pilot, a navigator, and four electronic warfare officers EWOs. Unusually, the navigator on this mission is a senior senior officer, 53-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Iseel Hamilton. Generally, he's responsible for scheduling navigators, but they were short-handed, so he took position of navigator for this flight. The NVA fires several missiles, and the B-52s, as well as the EB-66s, perform evasive maneuvers. On BAT-21, one of the EWOs calls out a warning as a SAM heads toward them. The pilot assumes the missile is going to go left and initiates a right turn for a SAM break, an evasive violent flying maneuver that can cause a homing missile to exceed its gimbal limits and destroy itself as it tries to follow the rotations of its target, but the missile flies right, so the plane turns straight into it. The crew yells at the pilot to go left, and he tries to reverse his turn, but it's too late. The missile explodes into a massive fireball as it collides with the belly of Bat-21. The pilot makes a hand signal to eject, having practiced it countless times before. Hamilton automatically fumbles for the firing mechanism on his ejection seat. As the compressed air cylinder under his seat fires and rockets him away from the falling aircraft, a second missile hits. Suddenly, Hamilton is 30,000 feet above Vietnam. He's spinning. Something's gone wrong during ejection. Worried that he's going to black out, he pulls his manual ripcord. His upper body snaps back as his parachute billows open and slows his fall. Hamilton looks around. There should be other parachutes in the sky, but there are none. His eyes sting. He's the only survivor. As he drifts lower, Hamilton realizes he's near a forward air control FAC-02 observation plane. He takes out his survival radio and tries calling using the call sign BAT-21. The pilot, First Lieutenant Bill Jankowski, confirms visual sight. He thinks about about trying to snag Hamilton out of the air, but his co-pilot dismisses the idea as impractical. Hamilton hits the ground hard. He quickly disentangles himself from his parachute and looks around. He's in the middle of a dry rice paddy. He can hear the thump of mortars being fired nearby. Not good. He darts into a nearby shallow ditch. Hamilton's bruised his back and there's a gash on his finger, but generally he's okay. The O2 circles overhead and notes Hamilton's position. He's landed in a bad spot, about a mile east of the village of Camelo, near a huge buildup of NVA troops. Jankowski gets on the emergency frequency and calls for any support available to help with the search and rescue or SAR mission. Two Jolly Greens, aka rescue helicopters, a few Cobra attack helicopters, and a couple of other aircrafts respond. But as they approach the area where Hamilton is, they take on heavy fire. A Cobra is shot down behind enemy lines. One crew member escapes the exploding helicopter and is taken prisoner. The rest of the crew is lost. Due to how hot the area is and the growing poor visibility, the rescue is called off. The Joint Search and Rescue Command, JSARC, orders 24-hour FAC coverage over Hamilton's position to watch over him. As they order the 7th Air Force to establish a standard 27 kilometers no fire zone around Hamilton, basically without approval from the JSARC, no friendly artillery, naval gunfire, or aircraft engagement can take place in the zone. The FAC arranges for Hamilton's position to be ringed with CDU-14 gravel, so he'll be hard to access. Those anti-personnel mines are about the size of a lemon. They explode when stepped on. When it gets dark, Hamilton finds a wooded area. Sitting under a tree, he inventories his gear. Among his supplies are a first aid kit, survival radio with extra batteries, flares, a loaded 38 revolver, a hunting knife, a signal mirror, and a mini compass. Hamilton digs a hole big enough to lay in, then he creeps around the area and does some reconnaissance. He reports to FAC on enemy vehicles and troops for several hours. Finally, he creeps back to his hole, covers himself with foliage, and sleeps. April 3rd, a SAR mission consisting of Jolly Greens and Douglas A1 Sky Raiders, aka Sandys, attempt a first light rescue, hoping to extract Hamilton with minimal force. Unfortunately, the weather's over cast, making it hard for the FAC to have visual control of positions and strikes. To make matters worse, most of the flight crews receive a briefing that doesn't tell them the extent of the battle developing near Hamilton. Also, the NVA 
has a listening post in the area where they monitor and jam US radio traffic. Once the aircraft flies through the bank of clouds, all hell breaks loose. The rescue mission comes under heavy fire. One of the Jolly Greens is seriously damaged and has to make an emergency landing at Fubai Airfield, which is actually also under attack at this moment and doesn't want them to land. They land anyway and avoid crashing by the skin of their teeth. The rescue mission holds, but the Sandys continue to drop ordnance to soften up the area. They also pinpoint targets to take out to support the SAR effort. A few hours later, a second rescue attempt is made, but they also come under heavy fire. A second helicopter is forced to make an emergency landing at Fubai Airfield. Further SAR missions are aborted. The area around Hamilton is just too hot. Meanwhile, on the ground, Hamilton reports on NVA positions when he can, but mainly stays hunkered down in his hole to avoid the troops searching for him. April 4th. Incredibly hungry and thirsty, at dawn, Hamilton goes foraging. He finds some berries and unripe pineapple. Carefully studying the ground to avoid mines, he sneaks close to a village and steals a few ears of corn from the fields. Jay Sark is briefed with some bad news. From listening to chatter on North Vietnamese radio broadcasts, the Air Force has learned that the NVA knows who Hamilton is. Not only do they want to stop its reconnaissance, but capturing such a high-ranking officer who's a ballistic missile expert with a top-secret clearance would be a strategic feather in their cap. Hamilton needs to be rescued ASAP. The day is overcast. Hamilton creeps to his observation spot to see how much damage the bombardment has done. A little Vietnamese boy playing in the woods with his dog spots him. The kid heads back to his village, carefully following the dog to avoid the mines. Hamilton watches as the kid tells some soldiers and points in his direction. Soldiers come to investigate, but they have to make their way through a minefield to reach Hamilton's area. As it's midday, there's no way he can get back to his hole without being seen. Hamilton radios FAC, who quickly agrees to create a diversion. They fly an O2 overhead and drop two white phosphorus marks marking rockets, engulfing the soldiers in a cloud of choking white smoke. The soldiers panic, turn, and race back toward the village. A few of them step on mines and don't make it. Taking advantage of the diversion, Hamilton crouches low, races back to his hole, and frantically covers himself with leaves. He lay there panting until he falls asleep. Hamilton wakes thirsty and disoriented after his nap. It's afternoon. Visibility has improved. A SAR mission with Jolly Greens and Sandys once again has to turn back because of heavy artillery. F-4s, Sandys, and some other aircrafts continue their bombardment of various targets. Targets. Unfortunately, some of them end up severely damaged due to intense anti-aircraft gunfire. One of the FAC observation planes, call sign Nail 38, is shot down by a missile, and its pilots, Captain William J. Henderson and First Lieutenant Mark Clark, have to eject. Henderson lands very close to Hamilton, about 500 meters away. He hides in a bamboo patch, but that evening, NVA soldiers come to dig a pit for an anti-aircraft artillery gun in a nearby field. Henderson's forced to surrender when they begin cutting the bamboo down. He becomes a POW. Clark parachutes to the ground safely, manages to elude capture and hides out. He's further away, on the other side of the Mu Gang River, but within two kilometers of Hamilton. Now there are two soldiers who need rescuing. April 5th. The weather is rainy. Hamilton catches some water and thirstily drinks it. He also saves water in a small jug. The Air Force performs some strikes and blows up several tanks and a few other targets a few miles from Hamilton. It's mostly quiet. The poor weather causes the SAR force to regroup and strategize. They spend much of the day repairing their aircraft. April 6th. The sun shines with minimal Minimal scattered clouds, great visibility. In the morning, the SAR task force waits on the ground while several F-4s and B-5s, with permission to fight in the rescue zone, destroy several previously identified targets. Both Hamilton and Clark see some of the action from their respective hiding places. In fact, the action gets so close to Clark that he radios FAC and asks them to back off a little. The Vietnamese Air Force (VNAF) also launches several devastating strikes just outside of the no-fire zone. In the afternoon, a SAR force of two Jolly Greens and four Sandys takes to the sky. The Sandys drop ordnance against again softening up the area for a rescue attempt. One of the Sandys is rigged to drop a survival resupply kit for Hamilton, but the arming device fails and the pilot doesn't realize that the kit didn't deploy until after he landed. As the SAR force flies toward Hamilton, he gets out a flare, poised to dash to the clearing. One of the helicopters suddenly breaks into an evasive maneuver, but it's too late. A strike hits the fuel line of the Jolly Green 76 and it explodes into a massive fireball. Both Hamilton and Clark witness the destruction. The six men aboard are lost. The survivors feel guilty that the men were lost lost trying to save them. The Air Force is able to pinpoint where the deadly ground fire is coming from. It's a nearby village. The Air Force and the VNAF bombard the area, taking out the artillery in the village and several other targets. April 7th. While directing naval gunfire from the destroyer USS Buchanan against NVA tanks, a USAF plane call sign Covey 282 is shot down by a SAM just a few miles from Hamilton. The two crew members survive the crash, but fly over attempts to pinpoint the survivors' locations are bombarded with SAM strikes. As a result, rescue attempts have to be halted. Sadly, neither survivor is ever seen again. This is the final straw, and General Crichton Adams, commander of military operations in Vietnam, declares that no further helicopters are to be used for SAR missions to pick up
pick up Hamilton and Clark. Lieutenant Colonel Andy Anderson, commander of the Joint Personnel Recovery Center in Saigon, begins working on plans for a rescue by ground. If Hamilton can get to the river some two miles south of him and float down it a couple miles, they can get a team to rescue him. Clark would need to do the same, but as he's nearer to the river, his journey should be quicker. Anderson has a team of Vietnamese commandos that he's been working with that he can assign to the mission, but he needs an American to go along as an advisor. Navy SEAL officer Tom Norris has recently finished an assignment as part of a team training Force Recon Marines to run covert special operations. He's quickly dispatched to lead the rescue operation. Anderson briefs the commanding ARVN Brigadier General Vu Van Gai on the rescue mission. In the last few days, the ground war has really ramped up and Gai has his hands full, battling NVA troops. He thinks the mission is insane and tells Anderson that he cannot guarantee the operation's safety, especially when they cross the Mu Gyang River. However, Gai agrees to provide them transportation to his most forward unit. This is a Ranger platoon of about 20 men and three M48 tanks at a forward operating base along Highway QL9 within observation range of the strategic Camlo Bridge. During the evening, Hamilton is notified that he'll no longer have a babysitter. FAC patrols are scaled back due to how hot the region is. Sometime later, Hamilton hears the roar of B-52s. He hunkers down as they heavily bomb near his area. For the first time, he wonders if he's being left behind by the war. In reality, the B-52 raid was carefully planned around where Hamilton was hiding. They hit several big gun emplacements, destroy a SAM site, and some ammo dumps. April 8th to the 13th. It's known that English-speaking NVA are monitoring radio communications, so coded instructions for the survivors are prepared. In fact, SAR contacts the commanders of the survivors' parent units and asks them to create a message based on each survivor's background that would clearly tell him to move to a specific location in a way only they would understand. They discover that Hamilton's an avid golfer with a photo-like memory of golf courses. FAC radios Hamilton and tells him, you're gonna play 18 holes, and you're gonna get in the Suwannee and make like Esther Williams and Charlie the Tuna. The round starts on number one at Tucson National. Hamilton is puzzled. They have to repeat the message a few times. It takes him about 30 minutes to break the code. The Suwannee is a river made famous by a song. Esther Williams is a competitive swimmer, and Charlie the Tuna is the cartoon mascot for sun-kissed brand canned tuna. The number one hole at Tucson National is 408 yards running southeast. So the code meant that they're going to guide him to the Mugang River using the courses of 18 specific golf holes. At the river, he would need to swim. His first task is to move southeast 400 yards yards. The other survivor, Clark, also receives a similar type-coded message. Hamilton quickly discards some items since he needs to travel lightly. He takes his knife, revolver, first aid kit, radio, and boots. Everything he leaves behind, he buries, attempting to wipe away all traces that he'd been there. Hamilton checks his compass and makes his way through the foliage, trying to move quickly without making too much noise. Hundreds of yards away, he can see soldiers gearing up for another mine sweep. He finds his way to a path and counts off the approximate number of yards. The first hole is right where there's a fork in the path. Hamilton rests in a clump of brush at the intersection and clicks on his radio. FAC tells him that his next play is hole number 5 at Davis Montham Air Force Base. The first four holes go well. Hamilton has a terrible fright when he stumbles over something in the dark that turns out to be a dead pig. The fourth hole takes him near an abandoned village that concealed the artillery guns that shot down Jolly Green 76. Around dawn, Hamilton hides under a pile of hay in the outskirts of the village to rest and wait for darkness. He falls asleep and wakes in the afternoon. During the fifth hole, Hamilton passes by a seemingly abandoned small hut. A scrawny chicken scratches in the doorway. Meat. Hamilton gets out his knife and pounces at the bird. A man collides with Hamilton and they wrestle on the ground. The man stabs Hamilton in the shoulder, but he fights back and shoves his knife into the man's chest. Hamilton backs away in horror from the crumpled bloody figure on the ground and runs. He hides under a pig trough. Hours later, when he's calmer and it's become apparent that no one is searching for him, Hamilton crawls out. He unzips his flight suit to check on the wound on his shoulder. Thankfully, it's not too bad. He uses his first aid kit to dress it. He's exhausted, but ready to go when it's time to check in with FAC. The SAR task force receives photos from a reconnaissance drone that flew over the area where Hamilton originally hid. Several armored personnel carriers are in the photo. The NVA made it through the minefield, searched for Hamilton and found him missing, so they've brought in additional troops for an extensive search. The US command in Saigon orders special high-altitude B-52 bombing raids on nearby targets to divert the NVA from searching for the two survivors. Clark makes it to the Mugang River and floats downstream. Norris and his team of commandos take a dangerous journey skirting several NVA patrols to intercept him. Thankfully, they're able to rescue Clark on the night of April 10th and deliver him to Anderson at the forward operating base. Clark is transported to the last outpost on the Qua Viet River at Dong Ha by an ARVN M113 armored personnel carrier, and then flown to Da Nang. Meanwhile, Hamilton completes a few more holes, then gets a little lost. He falls off a cliff and breaks his arm. Finally, he makes it to the river and, per FAC instructions, floats downstream. It's mainly willpower keeping Hamilton moving at this point. He's cold, wet, stressed, and 
and has gone over a week with minimal food and water. Finally, he reaches his destination spot. He crawls out of the water and hides in the undergrowth near the shore. Later, Hamilton wakes up stiff and sore. He hears splashing and realizes that someone is paddling. Several soldiers are coming down the river in a sampan, guns in their laps, shining flashlights on the shore. Hamilton's heart beats frantically. It's a long moment before the soldiers move on. Anderson calls in airstrikes in an attempt to soften the area, but the NVA fights back with mortar rounds and B-40 rockets. Some rockets strike the team's position. One commando is killed. Anderson, Lt. To Ngoc Vu, the senior Vietnamese commando, and all of the Vietnamese officers are hurt. Anderson and the wounded Vietnamese troops have to be evacuated. Navy SEAL Norris is left with five Vietnamese commandos with limited English-speaking skills. After dark, Norris and his team set out, but the NVA attacks again. Two of the five remaining ARVN commandos are killed. Norris and the team regroup. They'll try again next night. Meanwhile, Hamilton is fading fast. He's erratic and not checking in on the radio. The next night, Norris and his team head upriver more than four kilometers, evading several NVA patrols. Upon seeing the extremely large number of North Vietnamese forces, two of the commandos balk, saying they refuse to follow an American just to rescue an American. Norris manages to convince them to stay by saying the only way they'd get back to safety is to stay with the team. Unfortunately, they don't find Hamilton, and after a few more hours of searching, return to the forward operating base. The next day, FAC pinpoints Hamilton's new position for Norris. He's moved 50 meters overnight. A Sandy drops a survival pack containing food, water, ammunition, and extra radios to Hamilton, but it lands 50 meters away on a hill. Unfortunately, due to rough terrain and exhaustion, Hamilton can't retrieve it. FAC and two Sandy pilots flying over are shocked to see Hamilton coming out of his hiding place and standing in the open on a sandbar, waving a white handkerchief at them. FAC convinces or orders him to go back into hiding and wait a little longer. Hamilton's mental and physical health are giving out. That evening, Norris realizes he can't force the commandos to go on the mission, so he asks for volunteers. Petty Officer 3rd Class Win Van Kiet steps forward. The two-man team sets out. While walking upstream, they come upon an empty, destroyed village and find an abandoned sampan and some clothing. The two disguise themselves as Vietnamese fishermen and quietly paddle up the river. It's a dangerous journey. It's pitch dark and eerie dense fog hangs low. Several times they pass NVA troops and tanks on the shoreline. When they break through the fog, they find themselves under the Kenlo Bridge. They've overshot Hamilton's last known position by half an hour. They quickly turn around and paddle back. Norris and Kiet find Hamilton lying in some bushes on the shore. He's weak and delirious. It's close to sunrise and Norris thinks about hunkering down and waiting for night, but Hamilton needs medical attention ASAP. It takes both Norris and Kiet to get Hamilton onto the bottom of the boat. They cover him with bamboo before paddling down the river. Soon, they're spotted by an NVA patrol. Some soldiers fire, but the rescue team furiously paddles away, using the current to their advantage. Unfortunately, their luck soon run out. As they round a bend in the river, NVA soldiers fire a heavy caliber machine gun from the north shore. The commandos pull the sampan over to the opposite bank and turn it over for cover. They call for air help. Five A-4 Skyhawks from the carrier Hankook immediately answer. The fighters drop ordnance and completely obliterate the NVA on the opposite bank. Two Sandys also assist, dropping both explosives and MK-47 smoke bombs to provide a smoke screen. Norris and Kiet move Hamilton back to the sampan and quickly paddle. As they get closer to the outpost, they receive support from South Vietnamese forces. When they land on the bank, they are met by some ARVN soldiers. Hamilton is unable to walk, so Vietnamese commandos carry him into the bunker. Once inside, they lay Hamilton on a stretcher and give him first aid. Norris radios for an M113 armored personnel carrier to carry him, Hamilton, and Kiet to brigade headquarters in Dong Ha. While waiting for the carrier to arrive, Hamilton smokes a cigarette given to him by a Vietnamese soldier. When the three arrive at Dong Ha, a reporter comments to Norris, it must have been tough out there, I bet you wouldn't do that again. Norris stares him down and replies, an American was down in enemy territory, of course I'd do it again. Hamilton is transported to a hospital where he recuperates for a month. During his 13-day ordeal, he lost 45 pounds. As a direct result of attempts to rescue Hamilton, five aircraft were lost and several more were severely damaged. Eleven people were killed and two were captured. Ultimately, the operation changed how the military approaches high-risk rescues. For his heroic efforts and putting his personal safety at risk to report on targets while in hiding, Hamilton is awarded the Silver Star, Distinguished Flying Cross, Air Medal, the Meritorious Service Medal, and a Purple Heart. Lieutenant Thomas R. Norris receives the Medal of Honor, and Petty Officer 3rd Class Win Van Kiet receives the Navy Cross, the highest award that the Navy can give to a foreign national. Thanks again to our sponsor, Conflict of Nations, the free online PvP strategy game with a new historically accurate Cold War scenario. Don't forget, the exclusive gift of 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription is only available for 30 days, so click the link in the description, choose your country, and fight your way to victory.
We know you want to watch another video. Learn how to survive as a prisoner of war here. Ever heard of badass soldier Robert McLaren, who performed appendix surgery on himself in a jungle while being advanced on by enemy troops? Click here to find out more.